Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cup Chat with Burning with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Uh, Maureen and I are excited to have a special guest, Marcy Heisinger from Land, Sea, and Sky today to talk to us about optics. So hi, Marcy, and thank you for joining us. You want to kind of give us a little bit of your background and what y'all do there sure. at Land, Sea, and Sky? Good morning. Um, so, right, I work at a store in Houston called Land, Sea, and Sky um, that's been around for 80 years, since 1940, and we specialize in optics sales mm -hmm. and repair. Um, and what that means is people with broken microscopes, telescopes, binoculars, that sort of thing from all over the U.S. send them into our shop um, for service and repair. And then we also sell some things. And so I'm here today because we're really involved in the birding community and um, binoculars are really uh, my number one favorite thing that we sell at the shop. So I'm happy to share any information that I can to help people um, get the right care for them. Well, that's wonderful. And so we're going to kind of go through some questions that we typically get or some things that I maybe want to know because I've done some looking around my house. It's obvious that all binoculars are not quite created equal. I mean, look at these. They look like they look like the cartoon binoculars that you would like go on a safari for. Oh, the bottoms twist too. <laughs> oh my gosh, guys. I don't even know what I'm doing. Like it looks like that comes off. Anyways, yeah. I think they may be ancient. They may need to come <laughs> to the repair shop, Miss Marcy. But let's first off talk about something that I think most people kind of question as they get started. What do the numbers mean? Eight by 32... What does that even tell us as we go binocular shopping? That is the right first question to ask. So the binocular that I'm holding is a Zeiss binocular and you'll maybe see here on the back, it says eight by 42. That first number eight X is the magnification. As I'm looking at that bird, that bird will appear eight times closer than it will with my naked eye. So that's important. And most common for birding in nature is an eight power, but a 10 power is good too. Um, you know, there's no bad binocular, but these are kind of the ideal range. The second number, the 42, is the diameter of this objective lens. I'm gonna pick up a different color. That black's not showing up very well in the sunlight. Um, here's a green pair that might do better. The second number is in millimeters, the diameter of this objective lens in millimeters, so eight by 42 means this has a 42 millimeter diameter. Um, most birders we see in the US use an eight by 42 binocular. Um, and that's because it is enough magnification to get on most birds and be able to identify them. And that 42 millimeter objective is awesome because it lets in a lot of light. So in general, these objectives are important because the bigger that objective is, the more light and color come down this dark barrel to your eye. The more light and color come down the barrel to your eye, the better your brain can make out detail. And so when you're trying to figure out what kind of yellow warbler that is, that can be just, you know, exceedingly important to you. The bad news is the bigger that objective lens gets, the bigger the whole binocular gets and the heavier. And so there's a bit of a trade-off regarding light coming down that barrel and size. So as you'll notice, this is an eight by 42 binocular. And this little bitty guy is an eight by 32 binocular. So you can see what a tremendous difference there is, um, particularly if you're you know, carrying this out in the field for a long ways, um, you might be willing to give up a little bit of light for size and, and weight. And I'm sorry, my, um, my light, speaking of light, my light's going all over the place. I've not done anything in this room. There we go. Well, with um, the time change. It's time of morning. I know it's really messing me up here. So yeah. sorry about that. We'll try to make that better. So that if that gets too wonky, just let me know. And if I can ask a question next. So Marcy, you talked a bit about the trade-off with those that second number, but with the first number, if I can see the bird bigger, why wouldn't I want, you know, a 12 by 42? Why don't I want that? What's the trade-off with that first number? Yes. That's a good question too. So there's a few things that happen as you go up in magnification. Um, the first thing is it's kind of awesome, right? Because now I'm seeing that bird not eight times closer, but 10 times closer or even 12 times closer. One of the most noticeable trade-offs, however, 
um, is that usually those lenses are bigger and heavier. And so the binocular gets a little heavier. But most importantly, just like you're magnifying the view of the bird or ship or whatever it is that you're using your binoculars for, you're also going to magnify any tremor or shake that you might have, any wind conditions that are happening, or if you're standing on an unstable surface like a deck. Um, any of that vibration is going to be magnified as well. And what happens is it makes it really difficult to achieve a good crisp focus if the binocular isn't really still. And so for that reason, um, for somebody that has a wee bit of tremor in themselves or we know they're going to be using it on an unstable environment, um, we actually recommend even going down in magnification to something like a 6 or 7x. It will really help them be able to achieve focus um, and, and not notice as much any tremble or tremor. Another thing that is worth pointing out um, is the field of view is different on every binocular. Um, so it depends on not just the, those numbers, the magnification, the diameter of the objective, but also how close these lenses are put together. And so some binoculars naturally have quite a narrow point of view or field of view um, and while those are, and, and a lot of pocket binoculars have a very small field of view. Well, that's not a big deal if you're in Paris looking at architecture, right? That architecture is not going anywhere. You can kind of afford that time to look around and find it and appreciate it. Yeah. Um, and even in a stadium binocular, if you're looking at, you know, Lady Gaga, you probably can pretty well guess where she's going to be and follow her around. But nature viewing is really different and it's much, um, more difficult to anticipate what direction you'll need to go. And it's funny, the trees like in your background um, can be really deceptive, right? Because all the leaves kind of look the same when you're in a hurry trying to get your glass on a bird. Um, so field of view can be really important. So the bigger field of view for a beginner birder or somebody that doesn't use their binoculars a lot can be a huge advantage to having a successful trip versus a really frustrating time with a binocular. Um, so in general, an 8x42 is chosen because it's fairly lightweight, so it's pretty easy to carry around. Um, the field of view is big enough that you're likely to be able to get the binoculars on whatever it is you're trying to see out in the distance. Um, and, you know, in general, it's just a really good all-around nature binocular. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, especially since so much of our audience is beginner birders. Um, for most of the youth binoculars that we have when we do our youth camps are either six or sevens because, again, kids tend to have really good vision. So it's less an issue of making it bigger for them and more an issue of making sure that we keep their field of view wide and adjust for the fact that they're maybe not the most stable in the world. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a good thing to consider. I personally use a 10 by 42 because my vision is bad blind. and my hands are, yeah, because I'm super blind, but my hands are also very steady and I've, I've, I've had enough practice as far as finding things that it's not a big deal. So I think those are just all important things for our, for our listeners to consider what will be best for them. So thank you, Marcy. That was a fantastic explanation. Now let's poke a little more fun at Maureen, Miss Marcy. Uh -oh. Because Maureen <laughs> is, I love you, but you do wear some very thick glasses, my love, and are blinder than a bat which bats actually see very well. So just, you know, you're pretty blind. What yeah. about people who do have eyesight problems? Are there, if they come into this, you know, if they come to y'all, are there binoculars that are really can cre be created or that work for people who have eyesight problems? Probably not just Maureen who's blind, but um, who maybe who've had surgery on their eyes or anything like that, Marcy. Or if so you're wearing yes. glasses and versus and not. Yeah. Oh, yes. We've got to talk about the, the little cups. And Marcy's wearing point. glasses, so that's perfect. Yeah. I'm on it. I'm on it. And um, I know the light's weird. I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, I've only done this at noon and after, so this 7.30 lighting is really getting me. So there's a few important things to know about your eyes and a pair of binoculars. And it's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to shop online for binoculars, and it can be done. You just have to know the right specifications to look for. The first thing that we haven't addressed yet is interpupillary distance, how close or far set your eyes are. And that is adjusted just because there's a center hinge in binoculars. And so it can make those eyes closer together or further apart. When you're talking about the youth birding program, the great thing about a, a six power, like a COA six by 30 binocular is that they can get super close interpupillary distance. 
So they're great for all ages. You know, you can give them to the youngest member of your family or the eldest. And not only will they not have as much problem with that potential shaking, um, but also the interpupillary distance is, is good on those um, little low magnification binoculars. And so they, they can be good for all ages. So that's the first thing. If you have really far set or close set eyes, the range of interpupillary distance is going to be of importance to you. The second thing you mentioned is the eye cups. And in this pair of binoculars, and can you see them okay? Uh -huh. Yes. Um, they roll up and down. And so I just turn them clockwise for down, counterclockwise for up. If you're like me and put your glasses on top of your head before you use your binoculars, you want those up. And then you can put them right against your eyes but look at all the distance that's taken up by if I'm wearing my glasses. So it would push the binocular out quite a bit. That's an easy way to remember that with glasses, you're better off um, putting the glasses on and then putting them down. So the eye cups down for glasses and right up against your eyes. And all you're doing is taking up that bit of distance, but it'll be really critical as you're trying to um, achieve the best focus. Also, if you see those little crescent, dark crescents on the edges of your field of view, you haven't got it quite right yet. So keep messing around with those eye cups and make sure that you have those hinges set exactly right for your eyes. And it's just a trial and error issue, um, but it'll really make your experience out in the field much better. That's so funny you said that. We had a young um, a lady at our Learn to Bird program last weekend who was having trouble getting birds and her binoculars and it was the simplest thing of once we had turned once we put her eye cups down for her glasses yes it made a huge difference in her ability to find those birds and find them quickly before they flew off because you know that's the most frustrating thing about birding is they don't always sit right where you want them to. so it so can be really challenging hey emily can you hold up both of your pair of binoculars oh yes <laughs> <laughs> So I the other think... thing people want to know is why do these binoculars look so different and which one's better? And the answer these is... These are my safari binoculars. Yes, those safari binoculars you have there, that's called a Poro prism design. And it's an older design um, and, and some people prefer it and some people don't. Um, all it means is that that light is going through some prisms um, before it gets to your eyes. But the view can actually be quite stunning. Um, so so there's, there's not a huge difference between that, the Poro prism binocular, and your other one like this, which is straight through. Um, this is called a roof prism design. So obviously the light's just going right down the barrel to your eye. So, you know, not a, not a huge difference. It's just a preference issue. The Poro Prism designs in general tend to be a little bit cheaper because they've just been being produced much longer. This right now, the Roof Prism design seems to be the most popular design for nature and birding um, and even some other hobbies. And, you know, it's, it's great. Um, can, I, can I just jump in with one more topic? Yes, keep going, Marcy. Oh. We're all ears. There's this huge price gulf between binoculars, right? You can go... Um, to a sporting goods store and pick up a pair of binoculars for under a hundred bucks, um, or you can pay several thousand dollars for your binoculars. Um, so we often have folks that are not familiar um, with hobbies like this say, who in their right mind would pay that kind of money for a pair of binoculars? And that's a valid question. But um, the answer is, as you age in particular, um, <laughs> and eyesight becomes not quite as sharp, um, the quality of your binoculars becomes more important to you. But even for children, we really want them to have a pretty decent pair of first binoculars uh, because otherwise they're magnifying the image, but they might not actually be seeing it any better. In fact, the image might be significantly worse um, through the binoculars than just with their naked eye. What, what you're paying for as you go up in the quality, man, this light is so bad. I'm just gonna try one more time to move this around. Mine's Sorry, you're gonna, too, so you're gonna take a walk around my house with me. I'm gonna adjust myself too while we're- Oh, so much better. Oh, Sorry yeah. about that, guys. We just get a full tour. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna get, yeah. You can see the coffee pot and the whole thing. Gorgeous. Okay. Um, thank you. Sorry about that. This is a real rookie mistake here. So what you're paying for with a more expensive pair of binoculars is the glass and the coatings on the glass. 
So the case, the focus mechanism, all of that is really going to be virtually the same in a pair of binoculars that cost $2,000 and in a pair of binoculars that cost $50. Um, what you're paying for is the coatings on the glass. And I'm going to just set you down here. Um, oftentimes, as you're looking at a pair of binoculars, you can see a bit of a sheen on them and it can, it can look purple or green. And that sheen is coatings. And what those coatings are doing is helping light and color traverse that dark barrel through to your eye, as we discussed before. And in the newer and more expensive binoculars, but even in some of the cheaper new binoculars, every so both sides of every piece of glass through the binoculars have coatings on them to that end. And so oftentimes they'll say HD, high definition, or ED, which stands for extra low dispersion glass. And that just means that that, that color and light is going to travel better. And the more money they spend on grinding that glass to be just perfect, and the more money they spend on coating that glass, the more expensive the binocular gets. But the quality of the view is really improved. Having said that, um, that technology has been around now for quite some time. So you're seeing even some um, fairly inexpensive binoculars come in with some really good HD coatings. Um, so, so really, there's a there's a, a great binocular, you know, at every price point. Um, another thing I will mention just My before big ones have no coating. I don't. Think. Right, right. Those older models <laughs> oftentimes. I'm not sure that there's any coating. I, and I had to do a little spit shine while we were talking <laughs> to, uh -oh, to, uh -oh, to, to make an evaluation the proper way to clean binoculars. I feel like you might it's, have been making her cringe while you were. It's sitting. not with the bottom of my shirt tail because I thought that's how you did it. <laughs> Emily, that was such a nice segue into binocular maintenance, right? <laughs> well done. So Maureen, Emily, you should not use your shirt tail to clean your binoculars. <laughs> um, although I know it's tempting. So when you're um, cleaning any of the exterior lenses of your binoculars, you can use, um, well, the first thing you wanna do is blow them off. And really it's okay to do it the old fashioned way. <sighs> or you can use one of those little air blowers that you use with your hand, right? It's just a little hand pump air blower. Um, what you wanna be really careful with is canned air. The propellant in the canned air comes out at, at such a temperature and with some chemicals that it can actually really ruin the coatings on your glass. So we don't ever recommend canned air, but if you can't resist, we want you to do it from a really good distance. So, you know, back up a good 10, 12 inches um, and then do it. But really just the old fashioned or, or uh, hand air first. The reason we do that is with the, you know, keeping in mind that there's coatings on here and we don't want to scratch the coatings. Just like my glasses, I, I don't want to, you know, get, you know, grind anything into those that will leave them scratched and you know mess up my view from then on. Once they've been blown, then you can clean them pretty much with anything that's safe for your eyeglasses. So even stores like Walmart and Kroger in the pharmacy section sell um, Zeiss lens cleaning wipes that are disposable for your eyeglasses. And those are safe for the coatings and those are safe for your binoculars as well. And so we just use that and, and, and dab and lift and dab and lift. So you're just hitting one little spot at a time with a fresh piece of the cloth. The reason we do that is because if we did miss a piece of debris on there, we're not just grinding it into the whole glass, right? We're just gonna be really careful and kind of dab and release. Um, but that is just a really quick and easy way to clean your binoculars. Um, I'm, mine are quite dirty on the eye cups because we leave these in our house sitting like this on a table. So all of that dust collects there. So we do clean ours um, often. Uh, you really should try to avoid cleaning them if possible, again, just to extend the life of the coatings on that glass. One other item I'll say not to ever do is Windex. We don't ever want Windex on the binocular. Windex has ammonia in it. Ammonia will etch the coating. Interesting. So what about if my binoculars are like my old school ones here? They've been around many years, obviously very dirty. Do, is it recommended, you know, send them to the shop, let them do like a really good clean on them um, after every 20 years or something, or just the little eye wipes and blow offs and we'll be good. Listen, <laughs> if you really want to avoid your binoculars going in to any of the shops, us, the manufacturers, whatever. You want to avoid it if you can. Um, there's really, 
what we're going to do is very similar to the, the process that I just described. Um, we do have a few little special tricks, which I'll share with you. We buy um, Q-tips that are 100% cotton on the edge, and that's how we get into the fine nooks and crannies. Um, we use Optic Safe Cleaner across the whole, across the whole binocular. Um, that way we can't make any mistakes. And so if you, if you need to get into those nooks and crannies, that 100% cotton Q-tip is a good way to do that and will be safe on the lenses as well. Never spray anything onto the lens. We really like those dice cleaning wipes for our customers because it takes away the temptation to spray something directly on the lens. Um, but the only reason really your binocular should have to come into the shop is either A, you can't quite get it to focus anymore. So perhaps there's a problem with a focusing mechanism which can be repaired, no problem. Um, or sometimes if you, you know, bang them against the edge of a boat or something, they'll be knocked out of alignment. That can be fixed, it's not cheap. Um, so we can do it. Um, if your binocular is still under warranty, we'll just send it to the manufacturer. If we break into that binocular, we'll void your warranty and we never wanna do that. So if you have something like a Nikon, a Swarovski, we will send that away um, and not even do that ourselves in the shop just to keep your warranty whole. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, um, it's best just to do that very careful self-care if you can, and then send them into us if not. One other thing I'll mention that may have changed in between those two pair of binoculars that you have there is <laughs> waterproofing. Heaven right? When you it. bought that Poro Prism binocular, um, it, I don't think I'm old enough to have bought it. I'm when you inherited <laughs> that poor prism it looked binocular. before my time, B.E., before Emily. <laughs> B.E. binocular, before Emily. Uh, when that one was produced, it may or may not have been fully waterproof and fogproof, but most binoculars now are fully waterproof and fogproof. Having said that, that means something different to every manufacturer. They all have their own standards. Um, really your binoculars, if they, you know, if you're kayaking and they fall into the river, you should be able to fish them out. Um, you can just pour uh, distilled water over them and usually they're good to go. However, if there's going to be a failure, it's usually at the very edge of the lens and you'll see that water has just seeped in the tiniest bit. Here in the Houston area, we've had that problem with all the people that have flooded over the years in these various hurricanes that have come through. So we've seen some binoculars in dreadful shape but they can be fixed. So fish them out, don't throw them away. Um, if the water seeps into that, um, you know, just into the very edge, you'll see it. It's not like your cell phone. We don't want you to put it in rice or dry it out. We wanna see exactly where that water got in if possible. So what we would encourage you to do is seal it up in a Ziploc bag and just send it into us. We can take these lenses off, clean it, realign the binocular, seal it up, um, and they can be fixed. It's, it's an expensive process, so it's not worth doing for every binocular, um, but it's worth a phone call to see. Um, and you know, if it's your favorite binocular to take in the field, um, sometimes just the sentimental value attached to it uh, makes it, makes it worth, um, worth a phone call to us to see if it can be fixed. But usually the binoculars are fully waterproof and you should be able to drop them in the drink and still fish them out and continue to use them. And uh, they should be just fine. But you don't advise us going underwater binocularing. Nope, <laughs> don't. Nope, nope, nope. Um, it's like one thing to drop them in and fish them right back out again. It's another thing to uh, really submerge them. Uh, the pressure of the water um, can be a real problem. <laughs> That's like the, the phone at the phone stores. And, you know, I always have to go off on these little tangents, but you know, like at the phone stores, they want to prove that the case is waterproof. And so they'll put the case in a bucket of water so you can see that it's waterproof. And I'm like, who does that? No one actually takes their phone in the swimming pool. So, but, and I think that's all fake anyways. Sorry, at and or whoever <laughs> your phone company is who does that. But I it just, it's unrealistic. But anyways, as we move, we kind of hit binoculars fairly well. I have, I have a question. Oh, of Don't course. You. And speaking of questions, if you are watching us live uh, and you have questions, shoot us via the comments. Marcy can answer those while we're live and um, here online. So, new feature today. Okay, I, feel, I think I have two questions. So, the first is what if you've been cleaning your binocular after your description of cleaning binoculars? Somebody's like, oh no, I've been doing mine wrong. And I realized that maybe I've scratched 
my coatings. Is that something that, that, that y'all can repair? Like if you realize that your coatings have been scratched? So that one's really tricky because it would require that lens be replaced. Um, so it would not be an inexpensive thing to do. Um, so it is it can actually be done, important. And it can to... be done by us and it can be done by manufacturers. Um, this binocular is a Swarovski binocular. Um, they make spotting scopes as well. We recently had a spotting scope come in where the objective had been cracked and they did replace that. Um, it wasn't hugely expensive uh, relative to the cost of the gear, um, but it was not free. So um, it can be done, but it would require um, replacement of that piece of glass that has scratches on it. So that's interesting. That is, we, I think sometimes you think about cleaning as just Maybe it's not the first thought that comes to your mind. And I, because I wear glasses a lot, I, I have those hundred box, you know, wipes <laughs> everywhere. And so I, I knew to use those on it. But, you know, I think sometimes if you're out in the field and you go, oh, it's dirty, I'll just use this bandana or whatever. But it really <laughs> is important to clean them the right way because it can be the most expensive thing to fix from what you're saying. That's right. Okay. That's exactly um, the right. other question I have is, so again, talking about um, how blind I am, when I'm wearing my glasses or my contacts, I see equally out of both eyes. But Marcy, I think a lot of people um, don't realize that some binoculars have a feature if your eyes don't see the same way. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. Thank you, Maureen. That's called the diopter focus. And every binocular has um, the ability to focus in general with the middle barrel focus knob. And then it also um, has the, uh, you know, usually has the feature to adjust the diopter focus, which corrects between the vision in both eyes. Um, so like you, I always leave mine set at a central position and that's usually marked. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but I'm gonna try. And this, so usually, oftentimes the diopter focus is on the right barrel. It can also be in the center. Oh yeah, there's your, you can see there's Emily's well. diopter focus. On this one, it's in the center and you pull it up and then oh. twist and then push it back down. And now the, the actual focus knob works. The procedure for that is get something kind of in a mid distance. You can keep both eyes open, but really concentrating on that left barrel, you wanna be sure that left barrel is in sharp focus, just like you would normally using that central focus knob. Then again, you can keep both eyes open but um, really concentrating on the right barrel, you want to change that diopter focus and just make very minute adjustments until your right eye is also seeing that same object just in crystal clear focus. And then set it and forget it. Now, most of the binoculars have um, little notch marks with pluses or minuses or numbers. And that's because if I'm sharing my binoculars with Emily, and my prescription's slightly different than hers, I might know that I'm always right in the middle. So mine's always set at the zero position, but I get them back from Emily. Suddenly I can't focus anymore. It's just because she messed around with my diopter focus, right? So I might check that and notice, oh yes, it's two ticks to the right. I can just, I know now that mine's zero because I've already been through that alignment process and I can just put mine back to zero and I should be good to go. So your setting really should be your setting. Um, for a long time until your prescription changes again. And, um, and again, that's a kind of set it and forget it thing. Now I will say a lot of people um, that will accidentally get jostled around and they'll come in thinking their binoculars are broken and require alignment or collimation, which is very expensive. The first thing we check is that diopter focus because sometimes they just, you know, they, they've used those binoculars for so long they haven't changed the diopter, but somehow it got jostled around and, and that can be a really quick and free fix. So before you call Lancy and Sky, you can check your diopter focus. If you can't quite get to focus, just mess around with that diopter a little and see if that doesn't correct it. And I think that's also an important tip for our any of our listeners who do youth education, because one of the things we see a lot of times with our kids is, you know, any moving parts are kind of fun to play with. So we, <laughs> a lot of times we'll get our kids with their inner pupil distance correct, or sorry, inner, inner pupillary distance. I said That's that. right. Um, and, but then they are there in the field and they go, er, 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 or <laughs> you, they've got the knob and they're just fidgeting with it back and forth. And so that, those are very common problems. I feel like when we've been doing um, education, both for youth and adults, because again, you don't, if you don't know what that knob is, you might not know to adjust it and then it can actually make 
a really big difference. Um, I like that yours locks in. <laughs> I wish yeah, that was super do that. cool. <laughs> <laughs> Lock them and they wouldn't go anywhere. But um, yeah, that's, that's, I think, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. It might be worth noting that there's one kind of binocular and it's usually a poro prism, that style um, that we were showing the Emily's larger set um, design in a seven by 50. And those are used by mariners, um, people out on ships and boats, ships captains use them. Um, lots of folks um, in our armed services use them. And those can actually have an option where you uh, focus each barrel independently. Um, so if you have a pair like that and you're having a tough time figuring out how those work, you can just Google how to use a marine binocular and it's a little different because um, the two barrels focus independently. Um, not the greatest choice for wildlife viewing um, for that reason, uh, but if it's what you've got, it's what you've got and it's better than not having a binocular, um, but it's just a little bit of an extra step to learn how those work. Okay, I thought of one more question before Emily gets to go again. Um, this was something that came up at our Learn to Bird um, that I know I have a personal preference on, but a lot of times when you buy a pair of binoculars, they come with a neck strap. Um, but then I know people see, so I personally on mine got the, what's called a harness where I've got the thing in, in the back and it kind of distributes the weight differently. Um, that's, I know that's a fairly minor thing because it's not super expensive to switch to something like a harness, but Marcy, can you share a little bit about the, those different types of how you hold your binoculars, how you're going to carry them around in the field with you? Yes. And so most binoculars like these will just come with a general strap. Um, and most folks do wear that around their neck. I don't know about you guys. I just hate that. That weight around my neck. I absolutely can't stand it. So there's a few workarounds if like me, you're uncomfortable with this. The first is simply getting a strap that's long enough that you can wear it across like a crossbody bag. Um, so now you've, you know, distributed the weight a little bit. Um, but even better than that is what Maureen referred to, and that's called a bino harness. The bino harness works like a backpack in reverse. So it, it distributes the weight across both shoulders rather than the back of your neck, um, which can be much more comfortable in the long haul. Um, it also keeps the binocular a little bit more snug against your body. So you don't have that bouncing um, kind of thing. If you are on a long hike, that can be a little bit bothersome um, and not particularly great for the binoculars either to be bouncing around like that. So um, it can hold it a little more snugly and comfortably to the to the um, shoulders and and back of the neck. Those are really inexpensive. Um, you can get one for you know twenty twenty five dollars. So that can be a really easy workaround to that whole strap on the back of the neck situation, which can be challenging. If you have a small enough pair of binoculars, um, there's also wrist straps and other kinds of lanyards and things available for those, um, so that you can really get a you know get something that works for you in your particular situation. That wrist strap sounds like it would be very easy to damage your binoculars with, though. Yeah, I think it's for people that really just hold their binoculars, and I often find myself not using the strap, which is not the safest way to go, right? So I'm really just holding them like this out in the field all the time or like this. Uh -huh. If I have the wrist strap on, at least if you I drop. fall, right, or, or drop them, they're not going to hit the ground. Um, I like you're the, right, it would have to be for a really lightweight pair. I like the satchel model. I just do the one shoulder strap. Well, and it's an important point, too, for what are you doing with them? Because <laughs> if you have backyard bird feeders and you only sit at your kitchen table and watch birds, which is a totally awesome way to bird, then you might not need a strap at all or just a wrist strap or you don't, you know, it, do, it doesn't matter. But um, yeah, if you're going on a long hike to see the Kalima warbler that Emily is so excited about, then the harness may be the way to go. So, <laughs> Yes, I'm so excited about the 4 a.m. hike time. Because of the time change, this is the first cup chat that I've actually been on time for. Um, in retrospect, I was early. I was ready at like seven. You were on before I was. I was impressed. It's usually not that way, guys, because I'm not wondering. Well, Marcy, it has been wonderful to have you, and thank you for joining us. We were going to dive into a little bit of scopage, um, but I think this is a great opportunity to kind of wrap it up and just uh, make you have to come back. Yeah, to talk yeah about you scopes. have to come back to talk about scopes. So I can't wait I, to come back and talk about spotting scopes. Thank you yeah. so much, Maureen, Emily. This was awesome. What a great way to start the day. Wonderful. Well, thank you everyone thank you. for joining us. And so Marcy, I do sometimes go a little crazy. And last time I went a little crazy and gave away a Birding the Border Pass for uh, our Birding the Border program coming up this April. 
And so Maureen, I do need you to pick a number between one and four so I can pick our winner off of our Facebook who commented with their, uh, the county or state that they're joining from. And Marcy, you know, I think I'll go a little crazy today too. And if you watch this video till the end and have commented on Facebook with your county, uh, if you're in Texas, comment with the county you're joining us from, or if you're out of state, let us know what state you are joining us from. If you comment with your binocular number, so whatever type of binocular numbers you use and your city or state, I will enter you into winning a Birding the Border t-shirt, which you will get in April, but I will give that away uh, today and go a little crazy. So, oh, thank you, Miss Erin Wright, for commenting already. Um, and yes, binocularing is a new word that I have invented here on Cup Chat. So, Maureen, one and four. Okay, one and four, random number. We have got four. Four. Well, wonderful. I will pass that along uh, to our winner and send you, uh, let you know how to register. But thank you so much, Marcy, for joining us. We're super excited. And you just now have to come back to talk about scopes. And thank you, everyone. And have a wonderful Wednesday morning. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye.